Mr. Chancellor, dear Madam Minister, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to express gratitude to Mr. Chancellor for inviting me to attend Petersburg Dialogue. It's a big honor for me to be with you today. Uh, as a host of COP29, Azerbaijan is in active phase of preparation for global event. We had uh, less than one year for preparation, so we are doing all our best in order to deliver good results. For us, being elected by unanimous decision as a host country for COP29, it's really a big honor. We consider it as a sign of respect of international community to Azerbaijan, to what we are doing, including in the area of uh, green energy. And definitely, it's a huge responsibility because we not only need to organize good event, but also to deliver good results. And I think that uh, Azerbaijan's international connections, active involvement in different international organizations will allow us to build bridges or to strengthen bridges, to strengthen solidarity between the countries of different continent. To say that, uh, I mean that we've been for several years, actually for four years, the chair of non-aligned movement, the movement which unites 120 countries. We've been elected by unanimous decision and our chairmanship was extended by unanimous decision for one year. So we have established during our chairmanship uh, very fruitful uh, relations with many members of the movement. Our chairmanship uh, coincided with COVID-19 so we acted um, in a very responsible way and provided humanitarian, financial, technical assistance to more than 80 countries. So this international platform for us, uh, I hope will allow us to engage uh, countries of Global South into the common agenda. At the same time, relations with many European countries also developed successfully with uh, nine members of EU, Azerbaijan signed or adopted uh, agreements and declarations on strategic partnership. So uh, saying that, um, I hope that these international connections will allow us to um, strengthen solidarity. That's mainly what we need. We need uh, finance, we need solidarity, and we need shared responsibility. Also, as a country which is rich in fossil fuels, Azerbaijan is a member of OPEC Plus platform. And um, I think this is also an additional advantage because we think that the country is rich with natural resources, particularly with uh, oil and gas, should be in the front row of uh, those who address the issues of uh, climate change. So these uh, different layers, I think, will create a uh, good spirit of solidarity and uh, will allow us to reach our goals. Um, as soon as we've been elected as a host country of COP, uh, the main attention of some media outlets was on our energy portfolio, energy background, and I was always saying that having uh, oil and gas deposits is not our fault. Uh, it's a gift of the God. It's, we must be judged not by that, we must be judged by how we use these reserves for the development of the country, for reduction of poverty, unemployment, and what is our target uh, with respect to green agenda. Our oil and gas will be needed for many more years, including European markets, uh, in 2022, EU and Azerbaijan signed the Declaration on Strategic Partnership in the field of energy, and our natural gas supplies to the uh, European Union is growing. That was a request of the European Commission, and uh, we positively responded to that. So now half of our natural gas export uh, particularly the 12 uh, billion cubic meters, is going to the market of European Union. And based on that declaration which I mentioned, by 2027, our export to EU 
uh, should reach 20 billion cubic meters. And we all understand that in this uh, geopolitical situation, this is a, a sign of responsibility of Azerbaijan, because we largely are investing in uh, increasing our gas production, because Europe needs more gas from uh, new sources. Uh, at the same time, uh, our green agenda started to materialize um, prior to uh, being awarded with COP29. We already started with our uh, foreign partners, investors, huge projects of uh, green transition. This year in Azerbaijan was uh, declared the year of Green World Solidarity Year. And only this year, uh, the groundbreaking ceremony, which will allow us to produce uh, 1,300 megawatts of solar and wind energy, uh, will be held. And by the end of 2027, we hope, and we actually we are sure, because the contracts have been signed, to have um, 2,000 megawatts of green and uh, solar energy operational. That will be nine power stations. And uh, by 2030, there will be additional 10 power stations of uh, solar and wind, which will uh, produce uh, five thousand megawatts, five gigawatts. So uh, using this potential, we will largely substitute uh, gas consumptions for producing of uh, electricity. And that volumes, I think at least five additional billion cubic meters of gas will be exported to Europe. So it's actually a win-win situation. We have created a very good investment climate. All the projects which I mentioned with green energy are financed by foreign investors. Azerbaijan just provides its infrastructure and a very friendly investment climate. We will save a lot of natural gas which Europe needs. At the same time, we are working now at the final stage of feasibility study to build uh, integrated transmission lines from Caspian offshore wind farms to Europe, including subsea cable under the Black Sea. That will allow Azerbaijani green energy at a volume of four gigawatt to be exported uh, to Europe. Our proven uh, reserves of offshore uh, wind energy is 157 gigawatt. So um, it's an illustration of the potential. For many years, wind created certain discomfort for Baku inhabitants, but now wind will generate a lot of activity, cooperation, partnership, and will strengthen energy security. So my last point is that energy security should be treated definitely as a matter of national security of the countries. There should be no discrimination. As a head of the country, which is rich with fossil fuels, of course, we will defend the right of these countries to continue investments and to continue production, because world is needed. But at the same time, countries with fossil fuel, as I said already, should be among those who demonstrate solidarity with respect to issues related to climate change. Once again, Mr. Chancellor, Madam Minister, thank you for the invitation. It's a big honor and pleasure to be among you. Wish you successful discussions. Thank you. Thank you, His Excellency. Our next speaker will speak in German, so I kindly ask you to put on your headphones if you are not fluent in the German language. The Excellencies, I welcome now on stage the Chancellor of Germany, His Excellency Olaf Scholz. President Aliyev, I'm delighted that you, as the host of the next COP, are here with us today. Esteemed ministers, dear Annalena, ladies and gentlemen, 
It is great to be able to welcome you all to Berlin. From here, we can look back on the successful COP in Dubai, and we're all working together to ensure that the conferences in Baku in November and in Belém next year build on this success. We want to support this process with the Petersburg Climate Dialogue. Let me start by honing in on the big picture. Our joint efforts to curb climate change are yielding fruit. We must get faster and we must get better, but the direction we are going in is right. All countries have developed NDCs for this decade. 78 countries have submitted long-term strategies with the objective of achieving greenhouse gas neutrality by the middle of this century. The mechanism of the Paris Agreement is working. The transformation towards climate neutrality is irreversible, not least because it also makes economic sense. We all know that there cannot nor will there be a return to the fossil era. Instead, we must seize the opportunities of the future, and that's precisely what we're doing around the world. This is demonstrated by the Dubai consensus to triple renewable energies, to double the rate of energy efficiency, and to transition away from fossil fuels. The United Arab Emirates, Azerbaijan and Brazil have now, as a troika, set out to take the next steps towards COP29 and COP30 uh, COP up until the submission of the NDCs together. And I strongly welcome this new form of intercontinental cooperation. The German government will do its utmost to support this. Ladies and gentlemen, Germany is on the right track. Last year, emissions were almost halved compared with 1990 levels, and that was in the same year, no less, in which we phased out nuclear energy. The latest figures show that we will also be able to achieve our 2030 target of reducing emissions by 65%. Uh, we have rapidly accelerated the expansion of renewable energies. The expansion of wind energy on land has almost doubled. We connected almost 15 gigawatts of new PV to the grid in 2023. Coal-fired power generation went down 20 percent and was at its lowest level in 2023 since 1990. At the same time, Wholesale prices for electricity were back to pre-energy crisis levels, or even below this level. We are also making progress in the area of industrial decarbonization. We've established carbon contracts for difference for the emissions-intensive industrial sector. We are building Europe's first hydrogen network, which is incidentally privately funded for the most part, and are lending our support to the transformation of our steel industry Moreover, climate tech is becoming an increasingly important business sector in Germany. With the European Green Deal, we have agreed on a huge climate action and growth package in Europe together. We will continue this path after the European elections to ensure that the EU achieves its goal of climate neutrality by 2050. Ladies and gentlemen, like Germany, each one of your countries will pursue its own path towards climate neutrality. It is important that we support each other in this regard. A tangible contribution that Germany is making is the Climate Club, which we will continue to drive forward together with our Chilean friends and all of its 38 members. The Climate Club is intended to ensure that we achieve greater cooperation greater transparency and greater convergence in the decarbonization of our industrial sectors. As a first concrete objective, we are seeking to develop a common standard for green steel prior to COP29. My goal is for us to develop the Climate Club into a format in which we coordinate our efforts more closely to achieve the decarbonization of the industrial sector and hold open discussions about the spillover effects of national decisions. This comprises, among other things, the international impact of subsidies, the development of green markets, and the avoidance of new trade barriers. Furthermore, we want to improve support for developing countries and emerging economies so that they can also transition to climate-friendly industrial processes more swiftly. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Mobilizing investments around the world for the transformation is an ongoing task for all of us. A new collective qualified, quantified goal for the post-2025 period will be negotiated in Baku this year. Unlike 15 years ago, the aim will no longer be to jumpstart technologies of the future. Rather, the focus will essentially be on financing the rollout of technologies that are available and cost-effective already today. According to the independent high-level expert group on climate finance, 2.4 trillion US dollars are required each year up until 2030 for the transformation in developing countries and emerging economies. That is a colossal sum. And because we're among friends here today, I'd like to mention the elephant in the room too. Public money alone, coming from a small group of countries at that, will not, with the best will in the world, be enough for investments of this order of magnitude. A discussion that only centres around public financial commitments falls far short of the mark. We need a new approach for financing climate action around the world. Three points are important to me in this regard. Firstly, investments in climate action are a joint global effort. And it is clear here that we will continue to lend our particular support to poor countries and to those that are especially vulnerable to climate change. The industrialized countries stand by their responsibility to mobilize finance to reduce CO2 emissions and to support efforts to adapt to the impacts of climate change. And you can rely on Germany. In 2022, we provided 6 billion euro climate finance from our budgetary resources we are committed to enhance the international finance architecture, such as with the reform of the World Bank and other multilateral development banks. My announcement to provide what is known as hybrid capital for the World Bank for the first time was followed by other countries at last week's spring meeting, giving rise to $11 billion of hybrid capital and guarantees. In total, the World Bank can therefore provide up to $70 billion of additional loans over the next 10 years. In Dubai, Development Minister Svenja Schulze and you, Mr. Al Jaber, each announced an initial funding of $100 million for the Loss and Damage Fund. This was the first time that an industrialized country pledged public funds together with a new donor. Such joint commitments for climate funds on a broader donor base are the right way to go. The world of 2024 is different to the world of Rio in 1992, when there were relatively few industrialized countries and a greater number of emerging economies and developing countries. Since then, many emerging economies have themselves become major emitters with increasing economic clout while the share of global emissions accounted for by industrialized countries has gone down substantially. Countries that have made a significant contribution to emissions over the past 30 years must also contribute to public climate finance if they are in an economic position to do so. The second point that I want to make is that climate finance must be geared much more strongly to facilitating private investments in sustainable growth. This can be achieved, for example, when development banks hedge local currency risks or via cooperative partnerships such as the JetPs in which we drive forward major projects together with development banks and private investors. In the G20 Compact with Africa too, we're working with our partners to improve conditions for private investments with a clear focus on the energy sector. We are not losing sight of the debt situation in this regard. We are planning to modernize our comprehensive bilateral debt swap program. While this isn't a panacea, vulnerable, middle-income countries that are willing to engage in reform efforts could also be eligible for debt for climate swaps in the future. My third point is that this is also a question of good framework conditions for investments in the individual countries themselves with clear roadmaps for decarbonization, for example. 
The update of the nationally determined contributions is therefore also an opportunity for all countries to safeguard investments in green technologies. Private investors greatly value reliable regulatory framework and good governance. We should also think of NDCs in broader terms and take aspects such as economic development and social justice into greater consideration. Ladies and gentlemen, I've made a point of speaking very candidly about the challenges facing climate finance, fully aware that perhaps not all of you agree with everything I say. But that, to my mind, is precisely the great added value promised by a format such as this one here. The aim is, informally and outside the framework of major conferences, to seek solutions constructively, openly, and creatively, with the objective in mind that brings all of us here today uh, together, namely prosperity and growth in a climate-neutral world. And now I'm looking forward to our discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, His Excellency Olaf Scholz, and again, thank you, His Excellency Ilham Aliyev, for your remarks.